Welcome everyone to the, uh, the, the final event of what's been a terrific three days. You know, when you, you start to plan these things and you think, oh, we'll have this person and that person, we'll do all this stuff. There was this moment when we started to put the program onto paper and went, we have 36 different <laughs> speakers on this thing. And it became, um, you know, it exceeded our, our expectations certainly. And so thank you to everyone for all the terrific presentations. Um, so thanks very much. And this um, won't be the last you will have heard uh, from the gathered uh, scholars. We are uh, going to compile um, and edit a new volume in our William F. Cody series on the history and culture of the American West with the University of Oklahoma Press. Uh, so all of the uh, presenters are invited, um, as they know, to submit their work um, for consideration for this volume. And then all of the rest of you are uh, invited to um, purchase and read that volume when it comes <laughs> out. So. Um, stay tuned. It's uh, a great pleasure um, to introduce tonight's um, keynote speaker. Uh, Paul Andrew Hutton is an American cultural historian. He's an award-winning author. He's a documentary writer and television personality. Um, he serves uh, st uh, as a distinguished professor of history at the University of New Mexico. And as we all know, he's published quite widely in both scholarly academic uh, venues and popular magazines, and he's reached you know, a very large audience through um, the, that kind of work. And his work has uh, been recognized far and wide. He's a six-time winner of the Western Writers of America Spur Award, and also a six-time winner of the Western Heritage Award from the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum for his work in both print and film. It's his book that Jeremy mentioned the other day, Phil Sheridan and His Army, that received the Billington Prize from the Organization of American Historians, uh, the Evans Biography Award, and a Spur Award. Um, but he's also the editor of, of several books that we all have on our shelves, um, Western Heritage, Roundup, Frontier and Region, uh, The Custer Reader, and Soldiers West, as well as a 10-volume Eyewitness to the Civil War series that he did for Bantam uh, back in the 90s. He started um, in, 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 in many ways reaching and shaping um, Western historical scholarship when he was an associate editor at the Western Historical Quarterly um, and then um, editor of the New Mexico Historical Review. Now, um, he has um, written several uh, short films, dozens of television documentaries, and he's in, uh, appeared upon, if this is to be believed, over 300 television programs on major networks, public television, and cable networks as well. Uh, you may have uh, known or seen the work that he did uh, behind the scenes as a historical consultant on Ron Howard's uh, film, The Missing. Um, he also uh, worked on John Favreau's Cowboys and Aliens, uh, and again re recently on Gavin O'Connor's Jane Got a Gun. Um, he's been very active as a public historian, making uh, a, a, an imprint on, on programming at museums by guest curating exhibits on everything from the Alamo, the Custer legend, Davy Crockett, and Billy the Kid. His latest book, The Apache Wars, was published by Crown um, in May of, the, of 2016, and it was recognized with a 2017 Western Writers of American America Spur Award for the best nonfiction. But um, coming up through um, Western history, um, uh, my, my academic uh, career came up during the time that we just saw reflected in the various toasts that we had. Uh, um, the, 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 the heady era of the new Western history, old Western history range wars. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, Paul. Uh, Hutton served as the executive director of the Western History Association uh, from 1990 to 2006. So, you know, when we think of Davy Crockett, you know, we have a popular image in our mind of Fess Parker. When we think of the Lone Ranger, it's going to be Clayton Moore. When you think of Sean, uh, J James Bond, of course, it's got to be Sean Connery, <laughs> right? Um, and when you think of the Western historian, you think of Paul Hutton. So it's my great pleasure <laughs> to introduce Paul to uh, speak to us tonight. Thank 
I know it's just uh, so common to think of me and Sean Connery in the same <laughs> way. Certainly my wife does. <laughs> Not. I want to thank the uh, Buffalo Bill Center of the West. I want to uh, thank Jeremy and his excellent staff. This really has been a, a marvelous three days. Uh, the only thing I've really learned as I've, uh, as I've aged is how little I know. And uh, being around all these bright young scholars this week has certainly shown me just really how little I know about, about something I thought I knew everything about. Um, it's just wonderful new work and exciting new work. And it just, it, you know, as a historian, one of the things that makes you get up, get up in the morning and after hearing that introduction of all this uh, stuff I've done, I, I understand why I'm so tired and it's so hard to get up, <laughs> hard to get up in the morning. Um, but I certainly um, uh, appreciate so much uh, uh, all that they are doing to uh, bring about uh, new insights, and but also to discover new material. I mean, we were we were shown all kinds of new material about Buffalo Bill, and uh, and his show this week is just absolutely astonishing to me. So, uh, thank you all for educating me this week. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to educate you very much uh, tonight. This room is full, of course, of experts on William F. Cody. Uh, the story I'm going to tell is a uh, is a familiar one. But I sort of thought that uh, thematically I might be able to pull together, uh, here's the last speaker, uh, some of the themes that we've been talking about this week and uh, put uh, Buffalo Bill in, uh, in perspective. And uh, let me start doing that by uh, telling you a personal story because we've been getting some of those this week as well. Um, the, um, of course, you know, we're here because it's the centennial of Buffalo Bill's death, William F. Cody's death. And um, that was in uh, 1917, which was the year of my mother's birth. Um, and then in 1968, 51 years later, I first visited this wonderful institution in company with two of my high school chums, um, Steve Horowitz and Don Fork. And uh, we had just graduated from Short Ridge High School in Indianapolis and we had Don's uh, Volkswagen bus, and we had Simon and Garfunkel's America ringing in our ears, and we went out in search of America. I'm still looking. Well, the boys were anxious to get to the climax of our trip, the, our final destination, the really uh, golden dream at the end of the Western Rainbow. We're all young men. Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> but I would not be a party to the trip unless we, unless we visited first the Black Hills, then the Little Bighorn Battlefield, and then here to Cody, Wyoming to, uh, to this museum. And they reluctantly agreed to, uh, uh, to that. And uh, they were uh, perhaps not as delighted as I was by this institution in 1968, but they, uh, they pretended to be charmed. Well, it's now been 49 years since I made that journey. 51 years from the time of Buffalo Bill's death till I made the journey, 49 years now uh, since I did that. And my point to you is just how short our history as a nation is and how an institution like this and what we're trying to convey is in fact uh, a connection point, something that connects us to America's living past. And it is alive and it dictates so much of our actions uh, uh, today. What's the old joke if you're, uh, people who don't know, you know the past or uh, have to repeat it and of course the curse of historians is that they do know the past and they have to watch the country repeat it over and over <laughs> and over. And if you live long enough, you get to see it being repeated even again. It's like, it's like if you watch it, I used to watch Days of Our Lives, if you watch it too many times, they just repeat the same plots over again. It's just so sad. New people, same story. <laughs> William S. F. Cody, 
was a man seemingly trapped in a distant past. Yet he was one who cared desperately about an on-rushing future for himself, for his family, his business, and for his nation. He was progressive in his politics. He favored votes for women long before that liberal icon Woodrow Wilson finally got around to, uh, to supporting it. And he was for his time and place, and you must always keep that in mind, he was for his time and place uh, incredibly enlightened on questions of race and equality. He had lived the American dream. He had risen from abject poverty to incredible wealth. He had been fawned over by kings and queens, presidents and captains of industry. And at the time of his death, he was the living symbol of what it meant to be an American. President Theodore Roosevelt described him thusly, an American of Americans. He embodied those traits of courage, strength, and self-reliant hardihood which are vital to the well-being of our nation. He was like the nation he came to symbolize, though, a bundle of contradictions. Paradox has been the word used. Uh, contradictions works as well. He was a hunter who became a conservationist. He was a friend to the Indian who was famous as an Indian fighter. He was a rugged frontier scout best remembered as a sequined showman who could have stepped off the stage with Liberace <laughs> or Elvis in Vegas. A living artifact of a pioneer past playing out his role in a world of telephones, motion pictures, automobiles, airplanes, skyscrapers, and finally, at the very end, world wars. Now Cody's life, 1846 to 1917, spanned a period of astonishing change. And he participated in much of that change. His father was a martyr in the fight to keep slavery out of Kansas. And as a uh, teenager, he fought in the Civil War. He rode for the Pony Express, <laughs> hunted buffalo for the railroad, where he earned his nickname, scouted for the Army, won the Congressional Medal of Honor in a fight with the Sioux, took the so-called first scout for Custer, in a celebrated duel at Warbonnet Hat, as it was really known, Creek in 1876, and took a final curtain call on his Western adventures uh, at the time of the terrible tragedy at Wounded Knee. That fight, though, at Warbonnet Creek, in which there was only one casualty, that fight is the defining episode of his life. And I want to talk about it, for it was, in many ways, a moment, an incredible moment, simply frozen in time, where Western reality and the frontier myth, the topic that I'm going to talk about tonight, came together. But first, a little context, just to set the stage of how we got to War Bonnet Creek. One of my favorite movies is Fort Apache, in which a the, the Custer legend, a, a Western legend, is proven to be entirely false and yet is covered up and protected by Army officers. And the, the line, in, at the final line in that film, which is just so powerful, is correct in every detail about a famous painting of, of Custer's last stand. And let me just say that this painting, too, <laughs> is correct in every detail. <laughs> Nothing is correct in that painting. Many serious scholars who spent a considerable part of their lives debating points such as this have placed the birth of the Western at 1823 with the publication of James Fenimore Cooper's novel, The Pioneers. Now some grumbled at the more enduring and clearly superior Last of the Mohicans in 1826 deserves that spot of honor. The point is well taken, but then others argue that the tales of Captain John Smith and Pocahontas, colonial Indian captivity narratives, or John Filson's marvelous little chapter on the adventures of Daniel Boone written in 1784 are the true origin point for the Western story, which is ultimately the story of America. Now there are those who give all credit to that talented Harvard dude who came right out here to where we are Owen Wister, 
and he captured the imagination of the world with his 1902 novel, The Virginian. It was Worcester who turned the American cowboy, and that word was an epithet, you know, and it's still used that way sometimes, you know, cowboy foreign policy, cowboy diplomacy. Uh, but when you said cowboy, you meant a wild, rowdy, uncontrolled element in your society. Well, suddenly he makes the cowboy into an American centaur. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Professor Warren. An American centaur. Yeah. He is so, he's always so riveted by my comments. I just. <laughs> it's like the kid in class who pretends, you know, that you're his favorite professor. And of course, he's always on his, his phone, Facebooking while he's in your class. Anyway. I took, I took Professor Warren's uh, phone away from him before we began. <laughs> was it was Worcester who turned the American cowboy into a national symbol, albeit with considerable help from, of course, our hero, William F. Cody, from Frederick Remington, from Charlie Russell, and, of course, from the cowboy president himself, the real cowboy president, Theodore Roosevelt. All cowboy presidents go to Harvard before they <laughs> Well, this debate has found expression among my class of people in the endless and sometimes tiresome argument over Frederick Jackson Turner's 1893 frontier thesis. Now, Turner saw the American national character and thus American exceptionalism as an outgrowth of the frontier experience. His critics, and there have been many, these days, it, it's like, you know, the premiere of Star Wars. You just line them up around the block. His critics argued that the frontier was one, but one of many forces that shaped our nation. And, of course, you can't argue with that. The argument, though, is one between process and place. <laughs> with the strongest modern interpreters sometimes referred to by people like me as the rabble, <laughs> led by Professor Patricia Nelson Limerick <laughs> of the University of Colorado. Professor Warren is just a fellow traveler with her. <laughs> but when you go to Yellowstone and you see those packs, she's the leader. <laughs> the leader. Well, this is exactly the same debate in historical circles that you have between Cooper and Owen Wister. Where does the story begin? Well, it doesn't matter where the story begins, I would argue. It's this rich and varied literary history, this rich and varied historiography that is central to our understanding of of ourselves. And we're always looking for that. You start when you're a kid and you're always looking for your identity. And of course, many of us never get there, but nations do that too, and we're looking for our identity. And we hope we're not like some of the other nations that we're familiar with. Uh, we want to be so special. <laughs> and it's always been this way. In the 1820s, Americans were in search of an identity that might unite them as a people. Who were we? 13 colonies? What the hell is that? I mean, how do we get together? How do we become one out of many? North and South accomplished that by looking to the West. Frontier America suddenly became respectable in literary circles with the success of Cooper's Leatherstocking Tales. Samuel Woodward's song, The Hunters of Kentucky, celebrating the prowess of Kentucky and Tennessee militiamen over the English at the 1815 Battle of New Orleans. Apologies to our English friends, but we, we elect presidents because they shoot English people. Um, <laughs> I'm a historian, I can only speak the truth. I love the British, I, I, tell, my, I tell my students that there's a beautiful thing about, about the British, is that they, they unite all peoples everywhere around the world. India, Africa, Russia, Germany, France, the United States, we've all shot at them. <laughs> because they're always in somebody else's neighborhood telling folks how to behave. 
and then they get themselves in trouble and they get all shot up and then they build beautiful statues in London which we all pay a lot of money to go visit. <laughs> very good. So it, was very, it was a very clever technique. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, that song, The Hunters of Kentucky, helped to sweep Andrew Jackson into the White House and border dramas, as they were called in those days. Stories like, such as Nick of the Woods and The Lion of the West, which was a play based on the life of Davy Crockett, became all the rage on Eastern and European stages in the uh, 1830s and 1840s. And the rise of Jackson and other Western political figures, including the legendary Crockett himself, symbolized the political and cultural shift in this country from the East to the West which I always cheer for, no offense to our Eastern friends, but since we've already done it in the British, why not just continue the <laughs> Timothy Flint's best-selling biography of Daniel Boone, the martyrdom of Davy Crockett at the Alamo, the celebrated adventures of Kit Carson and John Fremont, and the romance surrounding the great migration to Oregon, which was immortalized uh, by one of America's first great historians, who was, of course, a Western historian, Francis Parkman, Harvard. <laughs> well, by the way, to Professor uh, Limerick and uh, Professor Warren, that is Harvard, not <laughs> Yale. Uh, but I went to Indiana University, so what the hell do I know? Uh, thank you, thank you all very much. Good basketball. Um, well, anyway, they all served to change the frontiersmen once disdained by the guardians of uh, American culture as a dangerous symbol of low breeding and anarchy into the very idealization of the evolving national character. Here's who we were. We're Davy Crockett. We're Daniel Boone. We're Kit Carson. We're those people pushing west on the Oregon Trail. That's the American. That's this new human that's come onto the planet from so many different places. Well, a ghastly civil war tore all this asunder. A great Westerner, the grandson of one who had followed Daniel Boone up the Cumberland Gap and into Kentucky, redeemed the, the dream, restored hope to the country, and Abraham Lincoln through the Homestead Act and the Transcontinental Railroad that he sponsored created a new Trans-Mississippi West and set it all in motion. And out of this story, out of the New West, a new epic arose. This story united a divided nation, North and South, forever cemented a national identity, now for a richly diverse people. Because folks were coming after the Civil War from everywhere. You want to know who you were when you got to this country? Just read a Buffalo Bill dime novel. It's right there. It's who you are. Doesn't matter that you're from Poland. It doesn't matter you're a, you know, Russian Mennonite. You know, it doesn't matter that, that you're an Italian. Get some buckskins, kid. Get a cowboy hat. <laughs> and it helped. It helped people unite. A, fifth, a fresh generation of heroes emerged to be celebrated in the popular dime novels that horrified parents and literary cr critics alike. Now we have the gunfighting lawman, Wild Bill Hickok, the heroic soldier, martyr to manifest destiny, George Custer, the scout, Buffalo Bill, the outlaw, Billy the Kid, the Indian statesman, Sitting Bull, the wild cowgirl, Calamity Jane. And from them came a story rich in romance and boundless optimism, yet also burdened, even while it was being told, with nostalgia for vanishing past because even as it played out, it was over, over in an instant. Buffalo Bill Cody, who had lived the reality of the Western story as a Civil War soldier, railroad buffalo hunter, and army scout, put it all into, of course, a grand extravaganza in 1883, and he took it on the road. His Wild West enthralled two generations of Americans and people around the world, created the cliches and conventions, followed by writers and filmmakers that were to follow him. Now, Cody was a true child of the American frontier. And he was a, uh, a person who grew up in the very environment that he was now celebrating. He was the third child born in 
Scott County, Iowa, on February 26, 1846, and William Frederick was the third child of Isaac and Mary Cody. Isaac moved the family to the new newly organized territory of Kansas, settling near Fort we Leavenworth, where he became a prominent advocate for free soil. He didn't want slavery extended into Kansas for whatever reasons. He, when he was giving an anti-slavery speech uh, in September of 1854, he was pulled from the platform and stabbed by pro-slavery men. And all the, although he recovered, in fact, won election to the Free Soil Legislature in Topeka, he was continually plagued by his wounds, finally dying in March of 1857 to young Billy. His father was a martyr, having, quote, shed the first blood in the cause of freedom in Kansas. With the family in financial straits after his father's death, young Billy Cody went to work for the freighting company of Alexander Majors and William Russell, the company had contracted with our government because President James Buchanan was trying to uh, take the spotlight off tensions between the North and the South by uh, having a war against the Mormons out in Utah who uh, weren't obeying, uh, obeying the government quite uh, as well as they needed to. And uh, so uh, Majors and Russell provided the supply wagons to keep that army going. On this trip uh, it, during the so-called Mormon War of 1857, uh, this young kid, Cody, struck up a friendship with James Butler Wild Bill Hickok. And when Russell Majors and Waddell initiated the short-lived Pony Express in 1860, uh, Cody briefly served as a, as a writer, and Hickok also worked for the Pony Express. With the outbreak of the Civil War, Cody quit um, the Express Company and joined a band of Kansas Jayhawkers preying upon neighboring Missourians. He was anxious to avenge his father's murder, and he was anxious to get some free horses from, uh, from Missouri. They have good horses over there. He felt no pangs of conscience uh, stealing from Missourians. Who would? Um, I'm just, I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm just picking on everybody. I've been to Missouri. It's very, well. Um, Cody readily admitted that these were not his best days. I entered upon a dis dissolute and reckless life, to my shame be it said, and associated with gamblers, drunkards, and bad characters generally. That was my experience when I ran the Western History Association for 16 years. <laughs> Um, after one um, particularly rowdy night in 1864, and as he later said, he, he was under the influence of bad whiskey. This is as opposed to good whiskey. Uh, under the influence of bad whiskey, he woke up in the morning and he had enlisted in the 7th uh, Kansas. And uh, so he became a soldier in the Civil War. His, his service was, uh, you know, not uh, particularly distinguished, but he certainly served in the war. When the war was over, he took himself a bride, Louisa Frederici of St. Louis, and he attempted to settle down to the life of a hotel keeper at his Salt Creek Valley home. He could have been the Marriott's, but instead, no, he took a different, a different tack. Uh, it was not to be because he was totally devoid, and his later career would prove this, of any kind of business skill whatsoever. And within a year, he headed west to seek employment with the Army. His buddy Hickok was a scout for the Army out of Fort Ellsworth, Kansas. And he got him, his young friend, um, a job. And while at Fort Ellsworth, Cody became acquainted with Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, 7th Cavalry, just beginning his Western career. And Cody uh, was asked by Custer to come and scout for him. And he uh, declined that opportunity, wise career move. Um, <laughs> and became instead a hunter for the uh, Kansas Pacific Railroad. The firm of Goddard Brothers had the contract to feed the railway workers and they employed Cody at a princely sum to hunt buffalo to feed the, uh, the workers. In eight months time from October 1867 until May of 1868, Cody killed 4,280 buffalo for the Kansas Pacific Railroad. Now I know then in a more environmentally sensitive time in which we live, and under the influence of the new Western history and its creed, <laughs> we do not celebrate um, that, but they were, after all, eaten. I mean, this was for food. Uh, th they weren't just being shot like happened, uh, happened later. And Cody, indeed, when he hunted buffalo, did it on horseback, uh, using, in fact, a single-shot uh, rifle. 
and uh, did it Indian style, which is unbelievably dangerous, of course, and, and uh, he was incredibly successful. Uh, with his breech-loading 50 caliber Springfield rifle, which he called Lucretia Borgia, and uh, mounted on his fleet horse Brigham, named for the Mormon patriarch. So you see, he had a sense of history from the very beginning, even as a young man. I'm amazed he actually knew who Lucretia Borgia was. That's pretty good, actually. Um, it speaks to the power of education in uh, territorial Kansas, I guess. <laughs> Um, well, the workers for the railroad, he became a popular figure, needless to say, because he's bringing them dinner, and uh, they made up a little song, a little song about it. Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill, never missed and never will, always aims and shoots to kill, and the company pays his Buffalo Bill. <laughs> That's your authentic American poetry right there. <laughs> Eat your heart out, uh, Europeans. Um, and let me just point out that it's not Bison William, Bison William, never missed and never will. It is, it is indeed Buffalo Bill. What is this going on to make us stop calling Buffalo, Buffalo, and call them Bison? Bison? I mean, is that like, is that like Greek and Latin derivatives or something? Bison? I mean, I know it's scientifically incorrect, like I care. <laughs> And I would like to tell you it's part of the American language, but of course it was Champlain, the Frenchman, who came up with the term and identified bison as buffalo. But nevertheless, just because a Frenchman did it, that doesn't mean it's not okay. <laughs> this goes to prove that the French can occasionally get something right. Isn't that amazing? The bison nickel. Bison wild wings. I mean, seriously. <laughs> And evidently, the Associated Press has uh, joined uh, with the government in trying to change the American language. And I no notice now, anytime Buffalo are mentioned in, the n in a newspaper, they must send out a style sheet. I'm sure they do. Uh, it, it, they're called bison. And, and I just think this is truly uh, the definition of fake news. <laughs> Combination of bad weather and, and uh, Native hostility temporarily halted construction of the Kansas Pacific when it reached end of track. And Cody's uh, contact with the railroad ended there despite uh, the fame he had derived. And he went to work at Fort Larned for, uh, for the Army and he carried dispatches. And this was a very, very dangerous job. And he did uh, such a superb job at it that he came to the attention of the new commander of the Army on the Southern Plains, General Phil Sheridan, the great Civil War hero. And Sheridan just loved this kid. And he became his protector and he became his sponsor. In a way, he became his mentor. And uh, Sheridan, um, uh, after Cody had made a couple of just incredibly daring and dangerous rides where, where no one else would carry dispatches, Sheridan promoted him and made him chief of scouts for the 5th Cavalry. Now, scouts are hired through the quartermaster department just for campaigns, but Cody is different. He is hired to be a permanent scout for the, uh, for the 5th Cavalry. And indeed, he did a uh, spectacular job, and soon he became the Army's most famous scout. On April the 26th, 1872, near the South Fork of Nebraska's Loop River, Cody led a squad of soldiers on a running battle with uh, Sioux Raiders, which won him the Medal of Honor on May 22nd, 1872. And uh, they cleaned up the, uh, he, he wasn't really technically a soldier, so when they cleaned up the uh, army rolls at the time of the First World War, they dropped him, but uh, certain uh, powerful political figures in this country managed to get it back for him. Uh, God bless Al Simpson. Um, <laughs> and he should have it, I mean, for heaven's sake. Um, Captain Charles Meinhold in the letter of commendation describing the engagement with the uh, Indians noted simply that, quote, Mr. William Cody's reputation for bravery and skill as a guide is so well established that I need not say anything else but that he acted in his usual manner. That sounds like Medal of Honor stuff to me. And his uh, words were typical of the praise that uh, frontier soldiers gave to Cody. Phil Sheridan, Emory Carr, Wesley Merritt, Charles King, Anson Mills, uh, and many other Army officers all praised Cody both before and after he became nationally famous. 
His exploits, although later exaggerated by press agents and show business hype, are absolutely authentic. One of the things that drives me crazy, and it's not a long drive, as you can tell. <laughs> one of the things that drives me crazy is, is uh, all the folks who want to present him as a, kind of a charlatan and a fraud. And my goodness, he's just, not, he's just not at all. He just did it all before he was 25. You know, I'm sorry. I wish I had. Um, <laughs> And indeed, later writers attempted to downplay his scouting activities, and many of them treated him as uh, just one of many comparable Army scouts. But he wasn't just like one of many comparable Army scouts. He was truly uh, head and shoulders uh, above almost all of them. And he certainly ranks with Ben Clark, Al Seaver, Luther Kelly, Frank North as uh, one of the great uh, scouts of the Indian Wars. In one 12-month period, for example, from October 1868 to October October 1869, Cody as chief of scouts for the 5th Cavalry, participated in seven, engage in seven expeditions against the Indians, engaging in nine fights during these campaigns. Few soldiers experienced that much action in a decade of service. All of Cody's frontier exploits, including 16 battles with Native Americans, occurred before his 32nd birthday. For after 1876, he devoted his time exclusively to the show business. Now, the grand maestro of Cody's rise to international fame and show business glory was an obscure writer of very limited talent, but of unflagging imagination, a man by the name of Ned Montlock. His real name was Edward Zane Carroll Judson. He had been born in New York in 1823. He was a plump little man. Uh, who was a master of the dime novel. He claimed to have written half a dozen of them in one week alone. <laughs> Writing and women were Ned's great passions, and he pursued both with vengeance. <laughs> he went through several fortunes and six wives, several of the wives he was married to simultaneously. <laughs> Not a problem for Ned. July 24, 1869, found Buntline at Fort McPherson, Nebraska to deliver, of all things, a temperance lecture. You've got to make a buck any way you can. <laughs> Learning that Major William Brown was leading a detachment of troops out after raiding Indians, um, Buntline, ever in search of a good story, volunteered to go along. Now, they didn't find um, any natives, but uh, he rode uh, along with Buffalo Bill during the uh, entire trip and um, they became pals. And when the troops reached Fort Sedgwick, Buntline promptly headed back east, promising Cody he'd keep in touch. On December the 23rd, 1869, the New York Weekly carried the first installment of Buntline's Buffalo Bill, King of the Border Men. The story was a fictional reworking of the already well-publicized and well-known adventures of Wild Bill Hickok, Cody's friend, who, by the way, Buntline kills in the story which really irked Wild Bill, who was not a guy you wanted to get on the bad side of. <laughs> Nevertheless, from Buntline's story was born the legend of Buffalo Bill. At Fort McPherson, the real Buffalo Bill was highly flattered by the tale, even if absolutely none of it was true. When his son was born on November the 26th, 1870, he proposed to name him after Buntline. Cooler heads prevailed, and the kid was named after Kit Carson instead. Good move. Now Ned Buntline was not a man to allow opportunity to slip away. He commenced scribbling a new dime novel right away, Buffalo Bill's Best Shot or the Heart of Spotted Tail, which began its serial run in the New York Weekly on March 25, 1872, and on and on and on and on they went. At the same time, Ned barraged Bill with letters saying, come on back here, kid. This is a gold mine. You are a gold mine. Cody finally relented thanks uh, through, uh, with the help of Sheridan, and he recruited another Fort McPherson scout, John B. Texas Jack Amahondro, to accompany him to Chicago and join in this novel enterprise. The scouts turned actor were met by Buntline in Chicago on December 12th. To their amazement, they found Buntline had no script, even though they were to open uh, Nixon's amphitheater on December the 18th. Retreating to his hotel room, not a problem for writers such as Professor Limerick, Professor Warren, and myself. <laughs> Retreating to his hotel room, Buntline pinned the scouts at the prairie in four hours. An unimpressed Chicago Tribune theater critic later asked why it took him so long. <laughs> 
Buttline hired 10 aspiring thespians off the streets of Chicago to portray Indians in his little drama. And he acquired the services of the lovely Italian actress, just Siopini Marlacci, to play the lovely Indian heroine. Unlike the other in, uh, members of the cast, Marlacci actually had stage experience. She was scandalously famous for having introduced the can-can to America. <laughs> That's right. A crowd estimated at 2,500 people crowded into Nixon's amphitheater for opening night. The play had no plot, which was fine since Cody couldn't remember any of his lines. <laughs> it didn't matter. The scouts were very handsome. Miss Malachi was incredibly fetching as an Italian-accented Indian maiden, <laughs> and the action was nonstop. The Scouts of the Prairie was a grand success. Even the theater critics had to admit that it might not be art, but it was certainly entertainment of a unique sort. <laughs> Wrote one critic, on the whole, it is not probable that Chicago will ever look upon the, this like again. Such a combination of incongruous drama Actual acting, renowned performers, mixed audience, intolerable stench, scalping, blood and thunder is not likely to be vouchsafed to a city a second time, even Chicago. <laughs> well, the Western had been born, and Ned Buntline, Buffalo Bill were the midwives, and popular mass market entertainment was never to be the same again. The play toured eastern cities, greeted by enthusiastic audience, stunned theater critics, and overflowing box office tills. So let me just point out that as the um, historical advisor for Cowboys and Aliens, I know a thing or two about drama. <laughs> so can speak to this subject with some, you know, some substance, some credibility, as I, I know at least three of you have seen that movie. <laughs> Very good, and the Aliens, absolutely historically accurate. Everything about them was just perfect, correct in every detail. <laughs> well, by the time the tour ended in June of 1873, Cody was fully committed to his stage career, and he, uh, he had a bright idea. He didn't need Buntline anymore, and so they parted company forever. For the 1873-74 season, Cody enlisted the pen of Fred Mater to create a new drama for the Buffalo Bill combination, as his gypsy troupe was now called, and the Scouts of the Plains opened in Pennsylvania on September the 8th, Buffalo Bill and Texas Jack played themselves, of course, with Miss Malachi again portraying another uh, can-canning Indian maiden. <laughs> but they have upped the ante because here was Wild Bill Hickok had joined the troupe, uh, joined his old friend. But alas, um, by, of course, by this time, Wild Bill had added to his laurels as a Civil War hero and a uh, uh, scout for the army by being the town taming marshal, you know, of Hayes City and Abilene and, uh, and a notorious man killer. Uh, and he just couldn't quite take this acting business very seriously. And Cody uh, kept trying to impress upon him how important this work was, but Bill couldn't quite get it. And so after one particularly heated uh, exchange, Cody, uh, Cody was left alone and Hickok departed in a huff. They met again only once in Wyoming in July of 1876 when Cody was scouting for the 5th Cavalry and Hickok was heading for the Black Hills boom town of Deadwood and a sad date with destiny. 76 was a tough year for Western heroes. They were just checking out right and left. <laughs> for a decade from 1873 until he left the boards to or organize the Wild West show in 1883, Cody toured in various frontier dramas. In every play, of course, he played only one role one he had perfected. Buffalo Bill played himself. That's what I do as a professor, constantly. <laughs> when each drama, each drama was supposedly based on authentic adventures from his own past. And that's the get, that's it, that's the point. It's this connection between history and drama that provided a unique electricity to Cody's sage presence. It made his blood and thunder dramas, no matter how silly they were, resonate. It's like if John Wayne really had gone up Iwo Jima instead of staying home during the war. Cody's 1876 tour was a huge success as well, but it was interrupted in April of 1876 
in Springfield, Massachusetts by a telegram informing Bill that his little five-year-old son, Kit, was desperately ill with scarlet fever. He rushed home to Rochester, New York, uh, where he, the little boy died in his arms. Well, he's just broken. I mean, he really was, he's just broken. And he gets a telegram from Sheridan saying, Bill, come on, come on west, we're gonna have this big Indian war. I know this doesn't sound politically correct, but we're gonna have this big Indian war, and it's our last chance. This is it, it's gonna be over. There's never gonna be another one. Wrong. Um, there's never gonna be another one, and come, and come join us. And Cody, Cody decided to do just that. And I, I have to believe it was the death of his son that was the, the deciding factor. After a final show in Wilmington, Delaware on June 3rd, Cody and Texas Jack split up the troop and Buffalo Bill headed west to Cheyenne, Wyoming. There he was reunited with his old friends in the 5th Cavalry on June 10th, 1876. He was immediately reappointed Chief of Scouts by Lieutenant Colonel Eugene A. Carr. And the enlisted men as well as the officers were all delighted to see him. And when he rode into the camp, the cry went up, here's, here's Buffalo Bill and hurrah, hurrah. Uh, everyone went. As Cody greeted old friends in the cavalry camp, there must have been a strange mixture of deja vu and nostalgia. Bill Cody, known so well by m so many of the old veterans of the 5th, had now become Buffalo Bill. He wrote dime novels and stage shows. Since departing the 5th in 1872, he had become one of the most celebrated actors in America. But of course, he was only playing a single character himself. Now he had returned to his past life of adventure, the one that he had so cleverly exaggerated in front of the footlights. Within a few days, both lives and both Buffalo Bills, the daring scout and the celebrated actor, would give their greatest performance on a ghastly frontier stage in which Western myth and Western reality would morph perfectly into each other. What's real? What's not? It's hard to tell. We're, wrote one of the uh, troopers who saw him. There is very little change in his appearance since I saw him last in 69, except that he looks a little worn, probably caused by his vocation in the East not agreeing with him. All the old boys were happy to see Carr and Cody together again. Well, the regiment had just been transferred north from service with the, uh, against the Arizona Apaches because um, there was a huge war brewing on the Northern Plains. Gold had been discovered by Custer in the Black Hills. The Grant administration was determined to get the hills and open them up to, uh, to, to mining entrance. Unfortunately, the hills had been given to the uh, Sioux under the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. Um, a decent price the administration thought was offered and uh, of course folks didn't want to sell. Well, that's a hell of an oak. And so immediately uh, mafia tactics were employed to convince them that it was in their interest to do business. Um, the government, the Grant administration, um, of course um, blamed City Bull and his so-called Northern Roamers, people who had never come into the, the agencies at Red Cloud and Pine Ridge, blamed them for these problems. General Phil Sheridan, Commanding the Western Army was ordered to drive the Indians in, and out came three columns, one from the, uh, one from the west, on, from Fort Ellis under Colonel John Gibbon, one from the east under General Alfred Terry with Custer's 7th Cavalry, the elite regiment of the Plains, uh, as his strike force. And up from the south from Fort Laramie came General George Crook with 15 companies of cavalry and five of in infantry, thousands of troops uh, out against the uh, the Sioux and their Cheyenne allies. And they were sure that they, they, had, enough, they had enough troops. But Merritt and, uh, and Carr and the 5th Cavalry were ordered up to block any more Indians that would leave the Nebraska agencies and try to join Sitting Bull's people. Um, they figured that they had at the most 500 warriors that they were going to confront. And that is because the bureaucrats of the Department of the Interior had lied to the Army, had of course inflated the censuses at the 
agency so that they could get more money for more goods which they could sell off to their crooked pals in, uh, in the West. It was uh, a pretty grievous business and in fact Custer had testified against this before Congress and had almost uh, been stripped of his command by an infuriated Grant, great, well, a good general and a terrible president. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so was kind of fuming about this disgrace uh, when he headed west, had a bad attitude to say the least. Well, and so uh, the 5th Cavalry heads north to, uh, to block the Indians from, uh, from joining up with Sitting Bull and his people. Of course, there weren't, there weren't uh, 500 warriors on the plains. There weren't 1,000 warriors on the plains. There wasn't 2,000 warriors. Uh, there were far more. And uh, they all gathered together. Uh, one last time for a great for this to do the Sundance and have a renewal of their of their uh, of their culture and their way of life and to just once more kind of just like Sheridan said one last time let's let's live the old days and that's what they were doing and they just wanted to recreate their past that they knew was slipping away and the army couldn't allow that because the politicians wouldn't allow it well as the as the fifth moves north. Then comes the shattering news, Custer is dead, along with every man of five companies of the 7th Cavalry. It had taken a full 12 days for the dispatch to reach the column. Uh, and they, of course, are perilously close to the scene of disaster. Everyone is just stunned. It was just like 9-11. You know, even as we watched it on television, you're, what is, what's going, what is that? What is, what's going, because you couldn't believe it. You couldn't believe it. Same with Custer. I mean, they, no one could believe it. This can't be true. No, but it, it absolutely was true. Well, this would make you nervous if you're kind of out there. Um, and so now um, they moved north. They'd been ordered to reinforce Crook, uh, who had been checked on the Rosebud River on June 17, 1876, by Crazy Horse. And um, Crook had retreated and hunkered down, licking his wounds. Um, without even bothering to send any messengers uh, uh, north to warn Custer of what was going on. Um, and Crook was, Crook was actually, Crook is a really highly overrated uh, uh, military figure in Western history. It's just stunning to me how uh, highly he's regarded by many historians. Uh, le let me just put it this way. If we had had uh, generals like Crook during the Second World War, I'd be giving this lecture in German to you. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, Usually Crook was a pretty cool, uh, cool customer, and he had, he had won his laurels fighting Apaches in, uh, in Arizona, but he was completely uh, thrown uh, a loop by this. And so he demanded Merritt's 5th Cavalry join him. But uh, Merritt instead uh, heard that the Cheyennes had left the agency and that they were heading up to join uh, Sitting Bull. And uh, he made a forced march north to uh, get astride the great Indian trail that led up to uh, the Bighorn and Little Bighorn River. And there amongst the troopers of the 5th Cavalry, Buffalo Bill was truly in his element. And he led the troops on a punishing 85 mile uh, ride, riding his strawberry roan horse. And uh, they reached uh, Warbonnet Creek and bedded down late on July 16th, 1876. Before dawn that morning, Merritt ordered Cody out to scout Little Wolf's approaching column. Coolly, um, Cody went forward, but oddly, he was dressed not in his buckskins as depicted here, but instead in a stage costume that he claimed was the only clothes he had. All right. He was in a Mexican vaquero outfit with pants of black velvet, trimmed in scarlet and flared at the bottoms. Would have fit right in, Hey ashberry 1969. <laughs> Had a little cigarette dangling out of his mouth, or not really a cigarette, but you know what I mean. That's legal there in Colorado where you teach, isn't it, uh, <laughs> Professor Limerick? That's gotta really help the classroom discipline. Yeah, that's gotta really help. Um, I'm sorry, I digress. <laughs> he had a red silk shirt topped with a broad brim beaver sombrero. And he had certainly dressed for his role that day. 
He quickly loaded, uh, located the Cheyenne village, but he returned to find the cavalry camp in full alert as Cheyennes had been spotted nearby. He reported to Merritt atop a slight hill overlooking the valley formed by Warbonnet Creek, also called Hat Creek. In the distance, a party of Cheyenne scouts formed directly across the little valley from the 5th Cavalry. And Merritt ordered Carr to silently saddle up the regiment and get ready for action. But uh, in the distance came a supply train, and the, the Cheyenne scouts were heading for it. And two dispatch riders were coming from the supply train toward uh, Merritt's command, and Cody could see that they were going to get cut off by the, uh, by the Cheyennes. And he promptly asked Merritt for permission to engage the Cheyennes with his scouts. And the colonel, as he hurried away to rejoin the re regiment, said, yes, absolutely, go ahead. Lieutenant Charles King, later to be a very famous novelist, was to watch from the hill and send in the scouts just before the Cheyennes could intercept the two messengers. Now, lads, in with you, cried King, as he sent them forward and off galloped Buffalo Bill and his men. They charged the surprise warriors, turning the tables on their ambush and scattering them with a rifle volley. As Cody's horse splashed across Warbonnet Creek, a Cheyenne warrior turned to meet him. Now, this is not a story out of Sir Walter Scott. This is a true story of the American West, and yet, it's stranger and more bizarre even than fiction could possibly be. And the name of the warrior was Yellow Hair. And like Cody, he had dressed splendidly for the day. <laughs> he wore a magnificent feathered bonnet, a special charm tin bracelet, and a beautifully beaded belt in which he tucked the blonde scalp from which he derived his name. His unique breech cloth had been fashioned from an American flag. I think that's a pretty powerful political statement. I don't know about you. <laughs> he, as his, he stood his ground as his handful of companions fled. He took a shot at the long-haired scout in the crazy velvet satin costume that was charging at him. He thought he, probably thought he was in Cowboys and Aliens. What the <laughs> hell is this? I know these guys are weird, but I mean, really now. <laughs> Yellow hair shot missed, but Cody placed a round through the Cheyenne warrior's leg, which dropped Yellow hair's uh, calico pony. At the same moment, Cody's horse stumbled, sending him tumbling onto the ground. He jumped clear as the horse fell. He did a somersault. You can't make this stuff up. I'm really not. And uh, came up with his rifle leveled and shot Yellow hair, just as uh, Yellow hair fired at him, yellow hair missed, Cody didn't. Rushing forward, he scalped the fallen warrior and raised the top knot and wore bonnet aloft as he cried out, first scalp for Custer. And the soldiers went whooping by and uh, the uh, Cheyennes retreated back toward the agencies. This is a moment, uh, there's a lot of debate about you know this, this scalp. Uh, to me, it's not that he's thinking forward. This is a good show business move. That comes later, he figures that out. No, he's reverted to his past. For just a moment there, he's back. He's just back. He's the, he's, he's the kid in the Civil War. He's the scout, scouting for the Army. He's just completely reverted to the, the savage state that uh, the frontier had, uh, had turned him into. Merritt ordered the regiment forward. Fifth Cavalry pursued the Cheyennes back to the Red Cloud Agency some 30 miles away. And the Cheyennes just quickly blended in with the rest of the population there. Lieutenant King remembered that the Indians were pretty darn impressed with Buffalo Bill. It sounds to me like just because of his crazy costume. One and all, they wanted to see Buffalo Bill, and wherever he moved, they followed him with awe-filled eyes. He wore the same dress in which he had burst upon them in yesterday's fight, a Mexican costume of black velvet, slashed with scarlet and trimmed with silver buttons and lace, one of his theatrical garbs in which he had done much execution before the footlights in the States, in which now became of intensified value. That night, an exhausted Cody wrote to his wife, quote, we have had a fight. I killed Yellowhand, and Yellowhair is often called Yellowhand. I killed Yellowhand, a Cheyenne chief, he promoted him, a Cheyenne chief in a single-handed fight. You will no doubt hear of it through the papers. I'm going as soon as I reach Fort Laramie, the place we are heading for now. 
I will send the war bonnet, shield, bridle, whip, arms, and his scalp to Kerngood, who was a friend back in Rochester, to put up in his window. I will write Kerngood to take them to you and show them to you. And Kerngood did that, and she looked at the scalp, and she promptly fainted right away. The 5th Cavalry now moved to reinforce General Crook's column and pursue Sitting Bull's people. Crook had over 2,000 men. They blundered and lumbered across the prairies. They did absolutely nothing. By the end of August, it was clear this campaign was going nowhere, and Cody asked for his release and uh, headed east to quickly put on a new theatrical combination uh, featuring a, a companion from the Great Sioux War, Captain Jack Crawford, the Poet Scout. The new play was entitled The Red Right Hand or Buffalo Bill's First Scalp for Custer and this five act monstrosity was according to Cody himself without head or tail and it made no difference at which act we commenced the performance. <laughs> well, it was of course his most successful play ever. Not the least of the show's attractions were the scalp and feathered war bonnet of yellow hair. Now the Northeastern press and our clergy in the East were not impressed, and they quickly sent up a howl of protest over this barbaric display. So Cody withdrew his tr trophies from theater windows and confined himself to brandishing them on the stage. So you had to pay to get to see them. Uh, this, though, uh, this controversy only increased the box office and made the play even more uh, successful. And finally, he stopped even showing the scalp because folks were passing out. Um, well, is the red right hand a case of art imitating life? Or rather, had the slain of the unfortunate yellow hair become a case of life imitating art? Cody had, in fact, dressed the morning of July 17, 1876 in one of his stage costumes and attired properly for the role. He had gone forth and killed the Cheyenne warrior in a grisly ritual that reaffirmed his status as a real, authentic, true frontiersman. Then he hurried eastward, scalp in hand, to exploit the deed. It was as if the frontier west had become a vast living stage, where Cody performed ritualistic acts of heroism and violence for the entertainment of the population of the industrial east. It was a unique moment in time, for the west was providing living, breathing entertainment for the East. By 1876, the frontier had already become an anachronism to folks on the East Coast. And after his premier performance at Warbonnet Creek, Buffalo Bill simply took the show on the road. The Red Right Hand was a rerun, and the residuals were quite profitable. Well, in 1883, as you all know, inspired by the success of a July 4th rodeo he staged in his North Platte, Nebraska ranch, Cody initiated his famous Wild West show. This outdoor spectacle combined, of course, rodeo elements like bucking broncos, wild steers, roping and riding with historical motifs from his uh, stage plates, such as the Deadwood Stage, the Pony Express, Custer's Last Stand. Various animals from the West were uh, brought east, put on display as were famous frontier celebrities, Frank North, Sitting Bull, and of course, Buffalo Bill himself. The cowboy, once so uh, such a pejorative term, now became an American hero in the form of William Levi Buck Taylor, the king of the cowboys, and Johnny Baker, the cowboy kid. Displays of marksmanship were provided by Cody Baker, and of course, most importantly, Annie Oakley, the sensation of the show, Little Sure Shot. As time passed, Cody would update these historical pageants over and over and over. He included the Spanish-American War, the Boxer Rebellion, and the Philippine Insurrection. However, events such as the attack on the Deadwood stage and the first scout for Custer remained always part of the show. As you know, Cody took his Wild West to London in 1887 for Queen Victoria's Jubilee, where he, he became an international sensation. He gave the Europeans just as he had given his own countrymen a glimpse of the vanishing frontier. He exploited the romantic possibilities of the American West making them intelligible to millions who had no other knowledge of the frontier than what he presented. He became a buckskin-clad goodwill ambassador. He won the hearts of the world as had no American since Benjamin Franklin. And he became, for the, year, for the rest of the world, like Dr. Franklin had been at the time of the American Revolution, the symbol of what it was. Who are these new people, these crazy new people? 
these Americans. Here he is. Wow. At 30, after 30 years in which uh, time Cody, of course, made and lost several fortunes, the Wild West show finally failed in 1913. He, he toured, of course, for two more seasons uh, with other uh, circuses and finally with the Miller Brothers 101 Ranch Wild West show in 1916. Well, William F. Cody had lived the Wild West from 1846 to 1876, and then he just took it on the road. First in stage shows and then in the greatest arena extravaganza of the 19th century and, you know, maybe of all time. What he told was a romantic adventure, a gilded historical pageant, a combination rodeo and circus, and most importantly, a tale of progress and of the birth of a nation. Cody told Americans and then people everywhere around the world all about how the United States had come to be. He became the embodiment of the new American the embodiment of the American spirit, and presented to the world an image of the rugged, rugged American as important to the 19th century as Dr. Franklin had been to the previous century. He firmly inherited the frontier mantle of Boone, Crockett, and Carson, and with an able assist from James Fenimore Cooper, Owen Wister, Remington, Frederick Jackson Turner, Theodore Roosevelt, he made the story of the American frontier into the nation's great creation myth. Buffalo Bill, astride his snow white stallion, presented an image that all the people of a rapidly changing nation could embrace no matter where they had come from. When finally he died on Janu in January of 1917, his country amount about to <laughs> march into a New century into a future of steam, steel, world wars, and international power. That country paused and reflected on just how far they had come in so short a time. It had all been encompassed in the life of one man, and with the passing of Buffalo Bill, the first great epoch of the American story came to a close. Thank you very much. Since we're, uh, since we're doing toast tonight, I did, uh, and I had actually already planned this, I thought it might, a toast might be in order, but when I was going through my personal history and mentioning important dates, I, uh, I neglected to, to mention that this, happen this week happens to be the 16th anniversary of my marriage to my lovely wife, Tracy Lee, which occurred just across the street in Buffalo Bill's Poker Church. Yeah, I take this Western <laughs> stuff seriously, absolutely. Talk about long-suffering women. Um, if I might, ladies and gentlemen, as we bring this fabulous conference to a close, I would like to offer uh, a toast to the, and I hate to drink it in water because like Bill would just slap me. Uh, I would like to offer a toast to the founder of the feast. Ladies and gentlemen, to William F. Cody, to Buffalo Bill. All right, thank you.